Hey guys, how's it going? It's really nice to be back at Seagraft. So my name is Ikani Solomon. I'm a freelance senior C4D journalist and motion designer that's based in New York City. And today we're going to be talking about some cool things. We're going to be talking about my short film, Hidden. We're going to be jumping in and taking a look at some of the process I use to de develop the film. And then we're going to take a look at some of the scene files. But before we jump into this project, we're going to take a look at my new demo reel. Thanks guys, really, really appreciate it. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be taking a look at my short film, Hidden. But you know what, before we jump into the presentation, let's actually just take a look at the film. So that is hidden. Thank you guys. Most appreciated. So as you can tell, we have a lot to unpack. I started this project, let's say, about a year ago. And I took like three weeks off of work just to work on the pre-production, just get the concept down and the story down. And then I worked on it over the course of a year, just in between my freelance and commercial projects. So there's a lot to unpack here. So let's just kind of jump in. So to plant a seed, like getting this idea, getting this start. So I used um, Cinema 4D and Marvelous Designer, and I was at this studio, Method Studios, and we were working on a pitch for a show called The Sinner. And I had made these design frames that I thought was really cool. And sadly, the designs didn't get chosen for the pitch, but I was like, I, we got to use these. These are pretty cool. So I, used, I made these using Cinema 4D, uh, marvelous designer. And it was perfect timing because at that point I really had an urge to make something, something that was narratively driven. And I also wanted to create something that had, you know, purpose and substance because, you know, we're, we're in a time where the tools are getting easier to make a lot of nice 3D content, but 
when you add some story to it or some narrative, it helps to elevate the work to you know, a different level. So I think it's very important to be not just a doer, but a thinker as well. You know, because again, if you want to stand above the pack, you need to do a little bit more than just do renders or maybe some abstract renders. So that was really the motivation to make a project like this. So the other thing I needed to figure out was uh, the concept and setting some parameters to the film. Let's just kind of close in the world that we're creating. So I wanted to do a film about human emotions and human interactions. And I also knew that I wanted the story to be a little bit whimsical and abstract. I didn't want to tell like a very, you know, literal film. So the film itself is a, self, it's a film about self-appreciation. It's about uncovering some of the thoughts and feelings that make us who we are, that we don't necessarily show to each other. So in the beginning of the film, we see these figures that are shrouded in this cloth. And the reason I did that is to make it almost synonymous with how we sometimes interact in society. Like we're talking, but we're not necessarily showing each other who we are. Also, each one of these figures kind of represents a different emotion. So like the black with chains, that's going to be like fear. This one, um, the red with the crystals, that's going to represent like love and affection. This one was um, greed slash ambition, and the flowers was joy. And as we proceed through the film, we can see again, you know, we start with this cloth shrouding these figures, but then as we go through, we begin to remove the cloth and peel back the layers, showing that what um, lies underneath is beautiful and, in fact, uh, very nice. Now, at the end, I show this crescendo moment where we see all the different emotions combined and we juxtapose it with the image of a human just to reinforce the idea that all these feelings and emotions uh, reside within you and make you who you are, and they're also a beautiful thing. Pre-production. So again, you know, it's about locking down those uh, narrative elements like the cloth, the elements, the positions, what, you know, what type of things that we're going to use. And then we're doing visual research. We need to figure out like, what posture these figures are going to have, how are these elements going to look, how are the textures on the cloth going to look like. And then doing some rough exploration and just compositions, lighting, shots, how all these things are going to look like. And then we create style frames to really hone in on that visual and on that aesthetic. And then we create shot folders and get all our production files organized before we jump into production. So this was how my visual research started. You know, just Pinterest, various in, um, images on the internet to really get a sense and a feeling of how this film might be, might look. And I really like, you know, just some of the elements and the vibes I was getting from some of these images. And then for each element, uh, I also got a lot of visual research. There's way more visual research than what you're seeing here. So, you know, like this posture, for instance, like this was very... Um, when I saw this, it, it gave me a feeling, so I was like, wow, this would be really cool as a posture to have in the film. So, you know, I looked at a bunch of different positions. I looked at materials that could be interesting to carry across the emotion of fear. And it's the same thing for, like, the love and affection piece, where, again, like, this image really spoke to me. And then these elements also really spoke to me. Uh, the same thing with greed, you know, having, like, this fully gold scene with no other color was just, like, a really powerful idea. So that's why I used it. And then, you know, I think this one was the hardest one to conceptualize, because one, you know, I wanted to really contrast with everything I've done before. So using the flowers and just bright colors, you know, really made it stood apart from everything else that I was doing in the film. So this is where Cinema 4D really shines. Like I'm not the best artist, I can't really draw that well. So like when I need to storyboard, I could just jump into cinema and make all these really cool um, compositions of lighting and all that stuff. So these were some really, really early studies I was doing. Again, you know, when you're making a film like this, it's very important to start with like a very broad brush. So I'm just trying to get a sense of like postures and like lighting. Do I want to make it dark? Do I want to make it light? And then, you know, when I got a sense that, hey, I want to make this in a really light environment, I was just blasting out a bunch of different lighting studies just to get an idea of what compositions look cool, what's the best way to tell the story. And again, at this point in the process, you don't want to be too precious with anything. You just want to keep making stuff. And you could tell like a lot of these shots like this one made it into the film. But again, a, a lot of stuff didn't. So this was just some of the studies that I was doing to get a sense of like how this film could look. So 
when I chose some of these shots and I put it in a rough edit and I got a sense like, okay, wow, this is kind of flowing well together, I decided to go do some style frames. So again, you know, with style frames, I think it's important to do it to get a sense of the lighting and just how the aesthetic is going to look because it makes your life so much easier during production because when you have a style frame, it's like a roadmap. So it was important to me to board out almost every single shot that looked very close to how the end result would look, but also keeping in mind that I have time to elevate the shot once I got into production. And you'll see like how some of these shots evolved over time. See, again, you know, a lot of it feels similar, but at the same time, like once you get to the flower stuff, or even this shot, you can see like in the final film how that evolved. Like these flowers really evolved, now have water droplets, like they came a long way. So again, you know, that's why it's cool to start off with these storyboards, because later down in the process, you could just change and elevate it, because now you have a jumping off point. So from there, I decided to take these frames and create like a rough markup. Now this is super important. Uh, let me just full screen this, kill the volume. So yeah, what's good about this is, is that when you have these style frames, you can now begin to like build and edit. And it helps you really organize your shots. So now you know, now you're just building a structure to the film and seeing how it feels back to back. Which again is important because when you're jumping into production and you're becoming laser focused on the technical stuff, you know, because you've done this pre-production work, you don't necessarily have to worry about it as much. So from there, and again, this is where Cinema 4D and Redshift is an absolute winning combo because Redshift is so fast, I don't even need to render Play Blast. I can render just straight 3D renders and get a sense of how like, motion might feel. And as you can tell, like, everything is really, really rough. But at this point in the process, all you want to do is just get a sense of like, how you're stitching together the story. And again, broad strokes all across the film. You don't want to get too specific just yet until you're satisfied that this narrative is feeling pretty good. So at this point, I think, OK, we're at a good point. Let's just jump into production. So we're going to take a look at some of these scenes and take a look at how we built some. So the first one that we're going to take a look at is uh, this crystal shot. What was cool about this shot is that it was, I don't want to say relatively simple, like it was a little bit tricky to figure out, but the setup is relatively simple. This is all using MoGraph, there's no dynamics, and it's all native tools in Cinema 4D. So let's jump into that scene file and take a look at how we're doing this. All right, so this is my scene file. Um, this is a little bit uh, stripped down from the actual production scene file. And you can see these textures here are thinking a little bit. Uh, so my workstation is a little bit locked up, but it should uh, release in a couple seconds. Just because I started a new version of R19. And here we go. So it's light enough where I could play, play it back and we shouldn't have any issues. So let's actually take a look at how we're doing this. All right, I'm just going to disable these shots in the back. And you know what? I'm going to disable this pheromone fracture as well. So when I'm fracturing anything, the first thing that I like to do is create a selection. And the reason I create a selection is because now I can add direct my shatter. So firstly, I create a selection. And then I create a matrix object. And I use that selection to feed into my matrix object. And you know, I just place my matrices on that object. Then I throw my shard into this Voronoi fracture and then put the particle generator, which is my matrix object, into uh, the sources, which is generating my fracture. And then when I do this, I have an art directable. Let me just turn this off for a second. Let me just turn off these MoGraph. Cool, I have this art directable shatter. And to just make this a little bit more obvious, I'm just going to put a large number. So you can see like we're getting nice small fragments where we had that selection. It's really easy trick, but really effective if you want to art direct your stuff. So let's just put this back down. And another thing we need to do, if we jump into this matrix one more time, 
you can see I have a random effector. Because you need to slightly randomize how these vertices are being cloned onto the object, else your pieces are going to look like this. So more or less, if you don't add like a randomize, all your pieces are going to look like little sprinkles, which you don't want. So now if I just add a random effect to this matrix object, you're going to get like more natural pieces. So that's super important if you're using this method. So that's step one. Let's get the break happening. And again, we're just going to turn down going to turn down the count on this matrix object. Perfect. And let's just hide this, these matrices. So how are we creating this effect? So the first thing we're doing is that we're using a plane effector with linear fall off. And here is the maximum amount of weight that's, been aff that's affecting these shards, and here is zero. So when I go back to the zero point here, two things are happening. In my plane effector, when I go to the parameters, you see nothing's happening because there is nothing in the XYZ position area. So as I'm scrolling through, I'm animating the XYZ, which is then affecting these clones. Now, the reason there's an offset is because, because we're using linear fall off, the plane effect is affecting these clones a lot more powerfully than these. And that's going in a linear fashion. So as you go from right to left, they wouldn't move. Um, they get a, a different amount of weight being applied to them. But when you look, once it passes this section, they all clump together because now they're being affected by the same amount of weight. And that's giving us this really kind of natural animation to the end here. And you can really see it if I take this plane effector and just go like, whoop. So that's step one. Now, if we revert back to this, we can see like, they're all coming from the outside and kind of sucking in. So for me, it was just obvious to use the random effector. And I'll just shut this off for a second. So now I'm using a random effector. And I just have the position parameters and some rotation parameters. And this random effector, this random effector also has linear fall off, but it's flipped. This is the maximum area of effect. And here's zero effect. So again, if I move this, you can see once it's past this area, they're no longer being affected by the random effector. And because I have like, some nice rotation and some position on there, it feels like relatively natural. So then when you combine these two, that's when you get that effect. So again, like, it's relatively simple, not a lot of keyframes, but like, when you see the animation, it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. Again, that's the power of MoGraph. So let me just jump back in here again. So what's happening here, you see the plane effector is moving the pieces past this area in the random effector. So that's what's really kind of setting this whole thing off. Now, even when we look back here, right, we get some really nice detail in here. And this is a testament to the new R19 detailing that you get in the Veronoid fracture. But to show you guys the demo, it was super duper heavy. And even production, it got really heavy. So again, you know, I'm using Redshift. And Redshift has a really nice feature where you could just bake this entire thing into a proxy, which worked great, because then I could retain all this high level of detail as a proxy. And I know uh, some, art, some of our artists might have been talking about this earlier and really reinforcing like, what a great tool this is in production. This is all just using an RS proxy. And I could, could change the preview. I could turn it into a bounding box. I could just turn it off. But when I, I render time, it still renders. That's the power of the RS proxy. So let's move on to the next shot. Uh, we're going to look at the flowers. So honestly speaking, this was by far the most difficult shot that I had to work on on the film just because of the sheer amount of geometry. When you look at each one of these flowers, there's water droplets on each one that's moving. And I couldn't use instances. So this is all geo. I'm going to tell you exactly why that is. So the first step in this process was actually animating these flowers. So the first thing I had to do was just animate each one of these flowers individually. Ooh, and we get this really nice, clean animation. So let's actually take a look at how we're building this rose. So I bought this model, but obviously it wasn't animated. So I needed to figure out a pretty easy way to animate this that wasn't like super stressful. 
so again, you know, cinema has these really nice tools to help you build simple stuff that looks complicated. So at its core, this is really just a flower petal with a bender form on it with some easing. So I'm doing this, scaling it up, giving it a little bit of animation, then I'm doing a radial, a nice radial uh, clone on this, so I get like this opening sequence, and then I'm just duplicating that in layers. So for the first couple ones, if I turn this on, we get this nice animation. And then for the outer ones, you know, I wanted a little bit more control, so I made those clonal objects editable, so I could just kind of move and position these petals where I wanted to because we were getting some intersections. And so for the other flowers, it was more or less the same process. I just did the same thing here, and we got like this really nice, clean animation. So that was step one. So I knew I wanted to get this really cool uh, growing effect, which we built here. And again, this is just using MoGraph tools. So again, you know, we see these flowers scaling up and blooming with an offset. Let's take a quick look at how we're doing this. All right, so step one, very simple, you know, we're using a plane effector with the scale parameter on minus one, and we're using linear fall off. So anything past here is affecting these clones, which are just shrinking them down to make them invisible. And once they pass through, they're just going back to the original scale, and they're scaling up. Pretty simple. So the next step really was to figure out how to do this offset. So I made another plane effector, and the plane effector has this really cool time offset parameter. So let me just turn this to infinite. So by default, if you just went in and you hit time offset, you're just going to time offset all the clones. And everything's going to be a 60 frame offset, which is not what we want. We want this one to just start immediately and then this one to be a, a offset of 60 frames. So that's why that linear fall off was super important. So what's happening is, here again is maximum effect and here is at zero. So at this point, these uh, clones are getting very little offset. And as we continue down the line, these clones are getting the 60 frame offset. So that's how we're achieving this. Now, relatively simple, but the big, big catch, which really turned out to be a pain in the butt, is that you can't check this awesome box called render instances. Just doesn't, just doesn't work, which presented like some serious problems for me um, in production. So again, this is the combined animation just using the scale and that time offset. And if you're wondering how, I'm get, how I got this uh, 60 frame set, uh, figure here, is because I animated my scale to 60 frames. So I know at 60 frames, my last set of flowers would appear, so that naturally I would want them to start blooming at that period of time. So how did we overcome the problem? Again, as you saw, tons of geo, every flower has water droplets, and it, it took me quite some time to figure out a good solution. So what I ended up doing, really, was just making it into an RX proxy. <laughs> RS for the win. Um, so that's what I did. I, I baked it into an RX, pro RS proxy, which actually took quite some time. But my gosh, when I did, it was just at render time, no problems. Everything just worked. And this is how uh, the preview looked. I'll just play it a couple times. So I did an RS proxy, and the cool thing about the proxy as well, uh, let me just pop this open. Movies on TV. The cool thing about the RS proxy is that you get this preview, but in the Redshift render view, you get the preview with all the textures and all the details. So like when I go in, all my water droplet information is there, but in the viewport itself, it's so much lighter to work with, which was like a true lifesaver for me. So. When you look at some of the final shots, I just ended up making everything into an RX proxy, which made my life uh, infinitely less crazy. So this is a shot, uh, the kind of final shot that I rendered. Let's put this on repeat for a bit. 
So yeah, you know, we have vines growing as well. We had water droplets on the figure itself. We have like some animating cloth. But you know, Redshift and Cinema just handled the scene pretty nicely. And the frames didn't take too long to render, uh, so it wasn't a bad process at all. OK, so that was the flowers. Next, let's look at some of these chains. For these chains, you know, we, we have them kind of like animating around the body. But not only that, when they wrap around, they're kind of constricting and tightening in on the figure itself. So I needed to find a way to like do that in a malleable, easy way. So let's just jump into cinema, take a look at how we're doing this. OK, so relatively pretty easy. So I have a cloner, and I'm cloning a torus. Just zoom in on this guy here. So I'm cloning this torus along this guide spline that I have. So it's just being cloned along the spline. And I'm using the step effector, if I enable it in the clone itself, to give it rotation. So this is where I'm getting my chain effect, like pretty simple. And all you have to do in your step effector is just enable the rotation. If I make this zero, you'll see. I just literally just keep rotating it until you get something that you like. Pretty simple process. So after that, the next, stop is, the next step is to animate this thing along the spline. So all I'm doing again is just giving it some offset. Relatively simple. Now, by default, this loop option is enabled. So you want to turn this off, because if it's not, it's just going to infinitely loop and just drive you insane. So you don't want to do that. So you want to turn this off. But now, the little key is this section where we see that spline kind of constricts. And for any of you guys who've done point level animation know how frustrating it is because it's very hard to use curves, right? The only way to do that is using timestamps, which is not the most easy process to do. So fortunately, we had pose morph, which is something I could use one slider and just do easing and just animate in between. So then we have this, um, we have this other spline here, which was more or less like my guide spline where I could just use this uh, slider to kind of morph between both of these modes. So whenever I wanted to constrict it, I could just do that. So for anyone that was also wondering how you would even achieve this, and again, it's relatively simple, let's duplicate that. I'll delete the tag. So say if you have two splines, you want to morph between those two. On this one, you just right click, you go to character tags, and you choose pose morph. And what you want to do, depending on what you want to animate, we want to animate points in this instance. So we select points, and we jump into, we want to just drag into a spline as our reference, and we want to hit yes. And again, the only reason this works is because both splines have the same amount of points. So that's super important. If it doesn't, then it's not going to work. So then all you have to do is hit animate. You want to hide the one that you're referencing, which is the one on the top. And there you go. You could just slide in between them, and this works. Now, this also works for pretty much any piece of geo that you have once it has the matching amount of points. There's some really cool Olympic baking stuff you could do with this technique as well. The other trick, too, was trying to get like splines that ran across the body. So for me. To do that, I had to use X particles. And what I did, I just shot some particles that ran across the body and just drew some splines for me. So that's how I got like these chains that ran across the surface of the body. And again, they had a lot of manual labor to kind of go in and just kind of make sure like nothing was intersecting because like things are crisscrossing certain places. And then like I went in with some bend deformers to like get the interaction with the cloth as well. So when you see like these chains running across, like say in this area here, there's some bending happening. All right, so we should have some movement now. So again, once this cloth comes up, this is how it looks like when I get it from Marvelous. Just shot this off. You can see we just have like a wealth of splines, and it's just like a combination of that same technique that I just showed, coupled with the X particle stuff. 
And you can see it just wrapping around. You know what, let's load this other shot as well. Because out of all the shots, I think this one was like the most hands-on, keyframe animation, making sure splines don't intersect, and all that type of stuff. Yeah, and I really just wanted to show you guys like all the different motion that was happening here, and just like all the wrapping that was happening. And then I had these colliders here on the cloth. And if I jump in here, I have like a collision object. So that's what's kind of giving us like these collisions on the cloth itself, just to kind of sell the realism. Personally, I'm, I'm just not a fan of dynamics. So wherever I can cheat, where no one would realize, that's what I do. So the most intimidating aspect of this uh, whole scene was doing like a photoreal looking human. The last project I did, skin in, it was like, uh, so I was a little bit hesitant going in to try to get this thing done. So I'm actually very happy with the results. And again, this is all using Cinema 4D and Redshift. So for the face, this was definitely like very much a compositing exercise. Because, you know, once I got the skin into a good place, uh, this is how the raw render looked like. I knew this is my theory when it comes to CG sometimes. I want to get it as good as possible or just good enough in CG. And if I know I could take it to the next level in comp, I'll do that instead of freaking out and stressing about how to get this looking better. So this is what I got uh, from CG initially. And then I just kind of rebuilt the skin. So I took the diffuse pass, I colorized it. And I took the specular pass, I did some color correction to it, I put it on top to get some nice oiliness to the skin, uh, you know, with some color correction and stuff. I did some editing to the eyes. There's a bunch of different steps that I'm not showing, but uh, that was more or less the process. And this was just like my nuke script that I used. So before I even rendered, I made sure and I rendered out a frame and I tested like what my workflow was going to be before I spent all this time rendering the shot so I'll have a plan. So again, when you're doing stuff like this, it's always good to test and have a plan before you invest all this work because you, know, you might just be burning time. So all the little details we're seeing here is actually displacement. Really, really fine displacement. And this is where Redshift, again, really shines. I could throw in a, a, a displacement map and just get this really fine level of detail and it's not really that expensive to render. Uh, we should have Redshift here. I'll just bring up the render view. I'll let this play my tape. Oh, wow. Process the textures re relatively quickly. So you're going to see this render. And I'll just select a little area below the eyes. And I'll do buckets so it's just really nice and clear. We'll let that think for a second. Thinking, thinking, thinking. And again, you know, this is calculating displacement. And I'm just using one card. So all this little detail here. That's displacement. That's no bump maps. That's actually displaced geo. And I could just jump in here. Let me select the face again. I could turn off all the displacement, and you will see the difference. It's, it makes such a huge difference between not having the displacement and not having the displacement. So you just have a completely clean face. So again, that's why. Cinema 4D, Redshift working hand in hand could just get you uh, really cool results. So I had to work with a couple of tools for this shot that I'm not used to. I know I wanted the eyes to blink, but I'm like the worst rigger in the planet. <laughs> so there's no way that was happening. So again, you know, as I was talking before, this is where pose morphs sort of come really in handy. Because all I would have to do, I could make a model that has the eyelids closed, and I could just morph between them at any point in time, which is like super easy to control with one slider. So whenever I wanted to blink, I just did this. So the other problem was, ooh, the eyelashes aren't moving. <laughs> what am I going to do? So this was kind of like a hack solution, but I also posed more of the eyelashes, <laughs> and I animated both of them at the same time, which gave me like a very convincing animation. 
I also had to use Cinema 4D's native hair tools to get the eyebrows. And again, I've never worked with hair before. I don't know what I'm doing. But when I went in, you know, I was pretty amazed, like the, the different hair tools that we had. Let me see if I can find them. Uh, I think they're under simulation. Yeah, so like there's a hair tools you could brush, you could cut, you could do all this different stuff. So that was really nice to work with. And again, Redshift really came in as a lifesaver to like get all this stuff done. Uh, you know, even if you look at the, the texture itself that I built, I was trying subsurface scattering, but I realized I didn't even really need it because I could just fake it in comp, which essentially is what I did. I you know it's a relatively simple shader build. It's just the displacements doing a lot of the heavy lifting and a lot of the tweaks that I'm doing in compositing. Cool, so that was the face. What else do we have to look at? Uh, we have the coins, but looks, look at the cloth because that's what I get asked on a bunch. So to do the cloth, I use good old Marvelous Designer. And again, I discovered Marvelous Designer when I was doing that pitch initial, initially, and I was like, whoa, Marvelous Designer is awesome. Reason being, you could get like real-time playback. Yeah, so Marvelous is awesome for stuff like this because you could like interactively play with the cloth. I could just move it, twist it, do all these different types of things. But again, like this piece of software natively is used to do close. So there's not a lot of options. So if you want like to animate it in a certain way, there's nothing you can really do besides turn on when and just try to blow it in the direction <laughs> that you're doing. So I also have to create like all the different simulation properties to try to get like the amount of wrinkles that I had. Uh, you know, it used to sim in like a relatively short period of time, but sometimes it would kind of be like up to luck. Because it's like, oh, is this one going to look good? Ah, yes, this one's great. I'm going to take this one. So let me see. I want to show you how that comes across. So this is what you get from Marvelous Designer, which is pretty cool. You know, you have this cloth. Just playing back slowly here. But yeah, you just have this nicely animated cloth. So you're probably wondering too, oh my gosh, this is like really low poly. How are we going to fix all this stuff? And again, this is where Redshift comes to the rescue. Oh, I already have it open. It's already, it's already rendering. So maybe that's why I was getting these slowdowns. <laughs> so you know, even if we preview it here in Redshift, let's make it interactive. Um, you know, it's still a little bit rough, but here, look at this. I could just go in. Just put some tessellation on this, and I need to enable it here again. And voila, it just cleans up. Nice and clean. Not very expensive at all. Really nice to work with. So doing the shots where it had like the cloth draping over the figures, oh, that was, that was relatively not difficult to do. Where it really got difficult was when I was doing some of these other shots where I had the cloth like wrapping around the characters. It's so, like this stuff was tricky because then all I would start with is like this big piece of cloth and I'd have to take a fan, blow it in this direction, pin it, take a fan, blow it in this direction, pin it, and then wrap it around. So they had a lot of manual wrangling to get this, uh, this kind of stuff done. But the cool thing was the end product, let me just see where I started here. So this is what I would do. It's just like a huge cloth with a bunch of pins. But the cool thing was, when I brought it into cinema, you know, you get like a really nice, cool, flowing cloth that works really well in the animation. And again, like if you're pre previewing with Redshift, it's nice and quick. I could just subdivide this um, in here with some tessellation. And we're good to go. But again, like getting the right simulation for this cloth <laughs> is such, it's almost like a gamble. But when you get a good one, it's really, really, really good. Okay, what else? What else do we have? We have some time. So the last thing we're going to look at, uh, the shot, some of these coins. 
so the cool thing with this stuff, um, with, with these shots in particular, this is where X particles really kind of came in handy. Um, the particles that's coming from the hands, that's all X particles. Um, the coins floating down is like a mix of MoGraph and the built-in and the built-in emitter. Where I'm, what's the word I want to use? Where I'm putting coins on the particles that are coming down and giving them dynamics. So as they emit, they just run with dynamics and they come down. Now, there's a really cool feature in Redshift where you could take a particle and you could just put geometry through it. So all these coins on the ground, they're actually just particles that Redshift is instancing on top of Geo, which, again, is relatively light. So let's just jump into one of these scenes, take a look. And you can tell that we have some coins just like tumbling down. Let's full screen this. Let's get rid of the cloth just to lighten up our scene a little bit. So we have these coins tumbling down. And again, this is all with MoGraph. It's just a cloner. It's just a cloner with some like random effectors. So as it plane effectors are making it come down and just giving it some rotation, it's just tricking you to make it feel like uh, there's some dynamics. So for this, I'm just using X particles. This is getting a little bit heavy because there's so many particles. So if I select the figure and I go into polygon mode, I just made a selection in between the figures to emit some particles. And that's what's kind of generating these particles on the bottom of his hands. Again, these scenes could get pretty heavy, especially with a lot of the X particle stuff in it. So just one thing quickly I wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm running out of time. Let's see if I can just find this last video really quickly. So in order to get like this look where we have the um, actual particles kind of glisten dynamically in the light, when talking about specifically these guys, all I really have is when the X particles are coming down, it's just one polygon, and I'm applying like a random effector to those particles that are just giving it random rotation. So all you have is like a really flat plane, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. The gold flake, uh, which is hidden somewhere in here, is literally just this. It's like literally just a flat plane trying to rotate around it. It's just a really flat plane, plane with a really, really reflective material on it. So no matter what angle it gets hit from, um, you're going to get some really dynamic light. And again, if you just look in my modifiers, it's just a random effector with some random rotation where I'm just rotating those, part those particles as it come down, which gives you like this glistening light. A uh, simple trick, but it actually took me a while to figure out that's what makes particles give you that gleaming light. So I think I've come to the end of my presentation. But before I wrap, I'll just play Hidden one more time so you guys could take another look.
Thank you, guys. So one more quick thing. All these scene files, everything is available for download on whole frame for the cheap price of 40 bucks, which is basically me giving them all away. You're getting all the scene files, all the textures, all the good stuff um, at this link. So if you want them, they're available here. Um, if you want to hit me up, check my workout. Here's my Twitter handles, handles my website, uh, my Vimeo. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for sticking around and taking a look at the work I've been doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Max Swan, for inviting me to speak at Seagraph again. And yeah, it's the end of my presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank <laughs> you.